Hey there, how you doing today? Man, I sure hope you're having a good day. Welcome to Sunday Night Bible Study. If you've got your Bible, go ahead and get that thing out. Today, man, we're going to be doing a study on the humanity of Jesus Christ. You know, a couple weeks ago we did a study on the deity of Christ, how Jesus Christ, he was not just a man, he was God in the flesh. So we're going to do now a study on the humanity of Jesus Christ. We've already established that he was not just a man, he was God in the flesh. But now we're going to talk about his humanity. I'm going to give you 10 things to help us understand that he was a human being. Now, first verse we're going to look at is 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 5 and 6. He says this, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. You see, there is one mediator between God and men, and it is the man, Christ Jesus, who did what? Gave himself a ransom for all. How many did he give himself a ransom for? All. You know, Jesus Christ, 2,000 years ago, he was sinless. He was born of a virgin. Whenever he lived, he lived a sinless life. He never did anything wrong, and he never ceased to do whatever it is that needed to be done that was right. He was sinless. But on that cross, the Bible says, The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. God took what we did wrong, he put it on his son, and he gave Jesus exactly what we deserve. He was a ransom for all. So he died for our sins. He was buried and he rose again the third day. When you put your trust in what he did, God gives you his own righteousness. He gives you Jesus Christ's record of never doing anything wrong. He puts that thing in, in your account and he doesn't impute your sin to you anymore. So if you put your trust in what Jesus did, he died for your sins. He was buried and he rose again the third day. You'll be made right with God in spite of of you, but because of this man, Christ Jesus, he gave himself a ransom for you, you see, but he was not just a man, he was God in the flesh, but we're going to talk about him being a man, look at Philippians chapter 2 verse 7, he says this, but made himself, talking about Jesus, made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of Men. So what likeness did Jesus Christ was he made in? He was made in the likeness of men. Does that ring a bell? Maybe we'll have a study on this. But Adam was made in the likeness of who? God. Jesus Christ shows up and he's now made in the likeness of men. Something changed. We'll talk about it later. But look at Romans chapter 8 and verse 3. Jesus was made in the likeness of men for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. So why did God send his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh? He sent his son for Sin. He's going to accomplish something concerning sin. And what is he going to do? He's going to condemn sin in the flesh. That's what Jesus Christ did. He hath made him to be sin for us. That is the reason why you could not be made right with the per holy and perfect God is because you had sin. So Jesus Christ came to condemn sin in the flesh. One of the ways he did that was he hath made him to be sin for us. He was made in the likeness of men. He sent his own, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. He showed up in the likeness of sinful flesh. Okay? Now, look at this. We're going to look at ten aspects of Jesus Christ's humanity, all right? One of the things is that Jesus Christ wept. Now, this might have been the first verse that you ever memorized. It's the easiest verse in the whole Bible. John chapter 11 and verse 35 says what? Jesus Wept. So what did Jesus do? He wept. He cried. Water came out of his eyes. He wept. Okay? Look at Luke chapter 19 and verse 41. Now, the context of that last one had to do with Jesus, Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. Okay? And he wept. 
And then their response to him weeping was, Behold how he loved him. They perceived that he loved Lazarus, and he wept. Okay? Jesus Christ knows what it's like to be in a situation where he not only wants to cry, but he did. Okay? Look at Luke 19, verse 41. He says, go back one. And when he was come near, he beheld the city. This is another aspect in which Jesus weeps. When he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it. In Luke 19, 41, you have Jesus Christ weeping over a what? A city. What city is that? Let's go to the next verse. Look at Matthew chapter 23, verse 37. He said that he came near unto a city, and he wept. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophet, and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. God, talking about Jerusalem, he says that they kill the prophets and they stone them that are sent to them. God sent prophets and people to the nation of Israel so that he could gather them as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and what would they not do? They wouldn't be gathered. So let's go back to the last verse. Luke 19, 41, And when he was come near, he beheld the city, Jerusalem. He's been trying to gather them for a really long time. And he, they pretty much kill everybody that he sends to them. He's trying to love them, gather them, care for them, be a shepherd to them, and he weeps over it. Because they, they won't be gathered. They won't be gathered, and that makes him cry. Jesus knows what it's like to weep. Jesus had a lot invested in, in Jerusalem. And one day they will be gathered, but not whenever he was on the earth. And another aspect of Jesus' humanity is that he hungered. Man, have you ever gotten hungry? Have you ever felt like, man, I am starving? I, I say that all the time, and I'm sure that I know nothing about being starving, but... Jesus Christ, he hungered. Look at Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 to 4. In this case, Jesus Christ is more hungry, most likely, than anybody that we know. But he says this, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights. You ever gone that long without food? Probably not. He was afterward and hungered. Jesus didn't eat for 40 days and 40 nights. Afterward, he got hungry. Does that make sense? God doesn't get hungry. But Jesus Christ, when he showed up as a man, whenever he was manifest in the flesh, he hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. What is he saying? He's saying, make something, an inanimate object, bread. Why? You already said you were hungry. You get it? But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. You know, the nation of Israel, and you can look at this up, look this up. The nation of Israel hungered in the wilderness. Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 3. This is where this quotation, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. That's where this bad boy comes from. They did not learn this. And whenever they got hungry, they got stupid. They got crazy. They did crazy things whenever they were hungry. Jesus Christ overcomes this temptation, and he does, as a man, understand this, and he holds to it. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. He got his sustenance from the mouth of God instead of the bread. Okay? That's how he was able to endure this temptation. Okay, But Jesus Christ, he got hungry. Look at Mark chapter 11 and verse 12. 11 and verse 12, it says, And on the morrow, when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry. 
Mark chapter 11 and verse 12 said Jesus Christ got hungry. And this time he hadn't fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. So it wasn't a thing where, you know, Jesus had to go 40 days and 40 nights in order to get hungry. It wasn't that kind of superhuman. He was a human being. He got hungry whenever he didn't fast for 40 days and 40 nights. So he knows what it's like to get hungry, all right? You know, we did a lesson... Um, I think it was nine sources of comfort in the Bible. And you know what one of the sources of comfort is? It's food. But Jesus knows what it's like to need food because he was not just God. He was a man. All right. Now, Jesus Christ, he thirsted. He got thirsty. Have you ever been thirsty? I'm sure that you have. But look at John chapter 4, verse 7. 4 verse 7, There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. Now the implication, he doesn't say, I thirst or I'm thirsty, I need some water, but he does ask for a drink. So the implication is, is that he got thirsty. If that doesn't suffice you and you think that he is just asking for a drink even though he doesn't need it, Above, right before this, he said that he was wearied in his journey. Okay? So, whenever you get weary, remember, that's another one we're going to talk about, but many times you get thirsty. As a human being, you have needs. You need water. Without water, you don't survive. Without food, you don't survive. Jesus Christ, not just God, he was a man too. All right, look in uh, John 19 and verse 23. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Jesus Christ is on the cross. He is suffering for sins. And Jesus Christ cries out as a lost person in hell, I thirst. You see, where do you get that? On the cross, he says, I thirst. The reason why he says that, he says, that the scripture might be fulfilled, but let's go to the next verse. Watch, watch close. Remember, remember with La, remember Lazarus and the uh, the rich man in Luke chapter sixteen and verse twenty four. You you get an understanding of what a guy in hell does and what he feels. He says, and he cried. This is uh, the rich man. And said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may, this is his one request. He's got two requests, but this is one of them. That he may dip the tip of his finger in what? Water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. A man in hell wants water. Jesus Christ on the cross, whenever he had said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me? He thirsts. Why? A man suffering in hell, one of his only desires is that he wants some water. So Jesus Christ thirsted on the cross. Now look at Psalm chapter 69 and verse 21. Psalm 69, verse 21, he says this, They gave me also gall for my meat, and in my thirst, that was him thirsting on the cross, they gave me vinegar to drink. This is what happened on the cross. He said, in my thirst. So on the cross, he said, I thirst. In Psalm 69, whenever he's depicting what happened on the cross, he said, in my thirst. The my is Jesus Christ on that cross. They gave me vinegar to drink, and that's exactly what happened. Vinegar doesn't help you with your thirst, just so you know. It's bitter. So, he thirsted, and he didn't get what would have sufficed his thirst. So, a person in hell, whenever Lazarus, whenever the rich man asked if Lazarus could come and dip his finger in water to cool his tongue, he didn't get it. You see, Jesus Christ died for our sins on the cross. 
He died because we had done something wrong, terribly wrong, against a holy and perfect God. But on the cross, Jesus Christ suffered in your place and he thirsted as a man in hell so that you wouldn't have to get to hell and want water yourself. Trust what his son did. Don't trust anything else. Trust what his son did. He died for your sins. He was buried and he rose again the third day. Now, another aspect of Jesus Christ's humanity is that he slept. You ever been tired? I've been tired. I'm actually a master at sleeping. The Bible says, be not many masters. This one just comes pretty naturally, okay? So I'm not boasting, all right? Now, but Jesus Christ, he slept. Look at Mark chapter 4, verse 38. He says this, and he was in the hinder part of the ship, Asleep on the pillow. Who knows this story? Remember, there's a ship. All the guys are in the ship. Probably the 12 are in, in the ship. And the ship is just getting torn apart by this storm. And they think that they're all going to die. And where's Jesus? He's in the hinder part of the ship asleep on a pillow. So what did Jesus go find before he went to take a nap? A pillow. I think that's interesting. I can sleep without a pillow, but Jesus Christ, he liked a pillow, okay? I'm just saying. And they awake, they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? Question, are they going to perish? No. But it's really weird that whenever we are inconvenienced, many times we Act like God doesn't care. We think God is supposed to be doing something other than what he is doing. Jesus Christ was asleep. They come down and say, you don't even care that we're going to die. He cared. And he knew that they weren't going to die. Many times our perception of what God's doing is not reality. This is completely false. Did he care that they perished? Yes, he did. And they weren't going to perish. He literally was going to go up there, have a conversation with the waves, and be like, hey, cut it out. And then guess what? It was like it never happened. Except for they had to probably swim after some of their luggage. Way not as, it's not nearly as bad as perishing like they thought they were going to. But anyway, Jesus Christ was asleep on a pillow. Look at Matthew chapter 8 and verse 24. He says, behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. Same mention, with the exception of the fact that he doesn't mention the pillow. Now, quiz, who else was in a ship while it was about to kill everybody, and he was asleep in the bottom of the boat? His name's Jonah. You should read the book of Jonah. I think it'd probably only take like 30 minutes. It's only four chapters. It's pretty good. But there are some similarities between Jesus Christ and Jonah. One of them is that he's sleeping at the sh in the ship. All right, now, Jesus grew weary. Jesus grew weary. You know, kind of funny. But sometimes after I eat, I can't breathe that good. It just wears me out. The weirdest things wear human beings out, right? All right. Jesus Christ knew what it's like to, to grow weary. Look at John chapter 4, verse 6. John 4, verse 6. If you'll notice, this is the woman at the well right here in John chapter 4. He said, give me to drink. Before he said that, this is what happened. Now, Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat on the well and it was about the sixth hour. So what did Jesus do, being a human being? He wearied. Does God get tired? God doesn't get tired. <clears throat> God doesn't get tired. Now, Psalm 121 and verse 4 is not on our paper. But, go back to the sleep part. Okay, so here he said that Jesus Christ was asleep, and I forgot to mention this, but Jesus Christ was asleep in Matthew 8, verse 24, and he was asleep on a pillow in the other verse. The question is, does God, does the Godhead sleep? 
If Jesus Christ didn't show up as a human being, would he go to sleep? He wouldn't go to sleep, and this is how you know. Psalm 121, verse 4. It says, He that keepeth Israel shall not slumber nor sleep. Slumber is like right before you go to sleep. Your, your vision starts to get a little blurry. You begin to slur your words. You're slumbering. You're almost asleep. But God doesn't slumber and God doesn't sleep. But Jesus Christ, when he showed up as a man, slept on a pillow. Okay? Now, Back to what we were saying as far as John chapter 4 and verse 6. He said, Now Jacob's well was there, Jesus, therefore being wearied with his journey. If you understand anything about being worn out, having a rough day, even, you know, running to the mailbox or something, you know, and you come back, you know, after 10 yards, you know, Jesus knows what it's like to be wearied in his journey. Jesus Christ was not just God. He was a man too. And he wearied. Okay? Now, Jesus Christ, he sorrowed. Jesus Christ sorrowed. Look at Matthew chapter 26 and verse 37 to 39. He says this. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Question, why is it that in the Garden of Gethsemane, his soul is what is exceeding sorrowful? I'll give you a hint. Isaiah 53 verse 10 says that his soul was made an offering for sin. So, in there's a good chance that we'll do a do a study on this as far as what this cup down here is. But whenever he says his soul is exceedingly sorrowful even unto death, he is looking forward to the fact that his soul is going to be made an offering for sin. Okay? So that's why his soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death. He's anticipating something. To a degree, Jesus Christ knows what it's like to worry. I say that to say this. He's anticipating something and he's exceeding sorrowful. Okay? So he knows what it's like to sorrow. Tarry ye here and watch with me. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. The father's trying to hand him a cup. He says, if it's possible, don't, let, don't make it so that I have to drink it. But not as I will, but as thou wilt. If you want me to drink it, I'll do it. He knows what it's like to be sorrowful. And he's anticipating his soul being made an offering for sin whenever he drinks what's in this cup. Look at Isaiah chapter 53, verses 3 to 4. He says, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our what? Sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. This is what they thought. They thought he was being smitten of God for blasphemy. Why? That's why he died. As far as the men were concerned, they thought that he was deserving of death. But he was acquainted with grief. He was despised, and he carried our sorrows. Do you know what it's like to be despised? People don't like you. Do you know what it's like to be acquainted with grief? Do you know what it's like to be full of sorrow? Jesus knows too. He knows too. He knows too. Look at uh, Luke chapter 22 in verse 41 to 44. He says this. As it's tied to his sorrow. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast. This is in the garden of Gethsemane. And kneeled down and prayed saying, Father, if thou, will, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And 
there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him and being in agony. Now, watch closely what he says. There appeared an angel. He's in agony. He is suffering and his soul's exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. And God the Father sent an angel to strengthen him and he was still in agony. That has to tell you something. That has to tell you that even though the Lord strengthens people in their sorrow, many times the agony doesn't go away. You think Jesus was in sin? He was being strengthened by an angel, and yet he still had these feelings. He wasn't. Sometimes God doesn't take the pain away. He just gives you comfort through it. So Jesus Christ as a man is no different in that example. And being in agony, he prayed. Now, if you're in agony, if you're in pain, if you're suffering, the right thing to do is to pray. But watch close. He was strengthened. He was still in agony and he still prayed. And guess what? He actually didn't get what he asked for. You know that Jesus Christ was about to suffer more than any human being has ever or will ever suffer. He asks God to not allow it and to make it so that it doesn't happen and he doesn't get what he asked for. But he sent him strength. He was still in agony. But Jesus, he prayed, even though he didn't get what he desired. Notice what he said. Not my will. That's his desire. The father had a different one. But then he, but thine be done. So he conformed to his will. He didn't get what he asked for. He was strengthened, and yet he was still in agony. But he prayed. Okay? Okay. More earnestly. It, he doesn't get what he's gonna what he wants, and he still prays earnestly. If God doesn't give you what you want or take away what you think he should take away, are you still gonna pray earnestly? This is hard. But Jesus Christ, he was not just God. He was a man. And whenever he didn't get what he desired, his will, he accepted the Father's will. He was strengthened and yet still in agony. And yet he prayed more earnestly. Okay? And his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. I'm not a genius. I'm not a doctor. I hear that this is something that actually happens to people whenever they're in complete and utter agony. Was Jesus praying? You know what most people would say whenever they're going through it? You know, you should pray. And should we pray? Yes, he prayed. But many times it doesn't take the stress away. Is that interesting to you? It didn't take the stress away from Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh. So he sweat as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Jesus Christ knows what it's like to suffer. And this is before, this is anticipation of the physical suffering. This is, this is suffering in the mind. Agony. Before it even happened. He knows what it's like to suffer, and he knows what it's like to be in agony. If you're in agony, you are in a spot that Jesus Christ knows about. He knows how to take care of it. But it may not go away. But he will send strength. Okay? God, which comforteth those that are cast down. He does that. But sometimes it doesn't take the pain away. Okay? Now, Jesus... That wasn't a, that was Jesus sorrowed. Jesus sorrowed. Now, Jesus also suffered. The next thing we're going to look at is that Jesus Christ, he suffered. Look at Matthew chapter 16, verse 21. He says, from that, from that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples 
how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes and be killed. Stop right there. From that time forth. So from Matthew chapter 16, 21 onward, he began to tell them something. He began to show his disciples that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and the chief priests and be killed. So, before this time, did Jesus Christ reveal or show that he would suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and be killed? No, not according to this verse. And be raised again the third day. Okay, so essentially we know that the gospel of our salvation is that Jesus Christ, he died for our sins, he was buried and he rose again the third day. That's the very good news that will save your soul today. But in Matthew chapter 16, he said that I hadn't said it before, but from now on I began to say it. And he began to show them that he was going to suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and be killed. Then Jesus or Peter's response to Jesus dying, being buried, or being buried and rising again the third day is this. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, this shall not be unto thee. What did Peter believe? This shall not be unto thee. Peter did not believe in the death, burial, and resurrection in Matthew chapter 16. Yes or no? He didn't believe it. This shall not be unto thee. What did he think? This isn't going to happen to you. In Matthew chapter 10, the disciples are sent out to preach a message. Jesus is preaching the gospel of the kingdom all through before this even happens. What they perceive as the gospel is a different message and has to be a different message because he says, hey, I'm going to suffer, I'm going to be killed, and I'm going to rise again the third day. Peter rebukes him and says it shall not be unto thee. He doesn't believe it's going to happen. So, is there more than one gospel? There has to be, because this is the gospel that saves you today, and Peter said it wasn't going to happen. Okay? Look at 23, it says this. He says, But he turned, this is Jesus, and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Jesus could not have been telling the disciples to preach the death, burial, and resurrection before, and he still wasn't, but before Matthew chapter 16. It's just physically impossible. Whenever, whenever Peter says that this shouldn't happen, Jesus Christ clearly is telling him that he's being satanic. He calls him Satan. Okay, so Jesus is going to die, he is going to be buried, and he is going to rise again the third day. But Peter didn't understand that, and notice what he says, Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. You see, the things that be of God showed clearly that Jesus Christ was going to suffer at the hands of the, the Pharisees and the scribes, and that he was going to rise again the third day after being killed. And we know that, he didn't know that. So the message that he was preaching could not have been the gospel as we know it. It had to have been a different one. I'm just saying. You can't cut that, that verse out of your Bible without maligning God's word. Now, look at 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. So Jesus said that the Son of Man must suffer many things at the hands of the, the scribes and the Pharisees. So what was he saying? He's going to suffer. Where was he pointing to? The cross. And he was going to say that some of that suffering was going to come from the scribes and the Pharisees. Now, look at 1 Peter 3, verse 18. He says this, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. What do you understand? Christ suffered for sins. Whose sins? His sins? No, our sins. Jesus Christ suffered, and the reason why he suffered is because we were unjust. He is the just one. The just one suffers one time for sins so that the unjust 
could be brought to God. Easy enough. So Jesus Christ knows what it's like to suffer. Look at First First Peter chapter four verse one. He says, "For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the what flesh." Jesus Christ suffered in the flesh. He says, Arm yourselves likewise with the same mind, for he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. I believe that this points to a different time period. Clearly, Peter's talking to the circumcision, but there's a time period in which a person, he says, He that is born of God doth not commit sin in 1 John. That lines up with this. Don't claim to understand everything about that, but this doesn't, us ceasing from sin, we're probably not going to cease from sin until we get to glory in Jesus' name. Okay? But Jesus desired company, okay? He suffered and he desired company. Now, this may sound kind of weird, but I was looking at this and I found this and I think it's pretty decent. Look at Luke chapter 22, verses 15 and 16. He says, And he said unto them, the disciples, with desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. So what does Jesus Christ want? He desires to eat the Passover with the disciples, yes or no? He does. And it just so happens that he said that he desired to do that. So Jesus wanted something. He wanted the company with the disciples on this Passover meal. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until <coughs> I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took bread and gave thanks and brake it and gave unto them saying, This is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. Likewise, also the cup after the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. What do you notice? He desired their company. He says his body is going to be given for them. This cup of the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you, for you, for you, but behold, the hand of him that betrayeth me is with me on the table. Now, I'm able to read through that and not think anything about the fact that somebody that he was close to, it says, my familiar friend is about to, to betray him. But it's very interesting to me that he desired their company. He desired their company. He's going to tell them some things that are important. His body is going to be given for them. This cup, his blood is going to be shed for them. And there's somebody here that's going to betray me. And they're at the table. And truly the Son of Man goeth as it was determined, but woe unto that man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to inquire among themselves which of them it was that should do this thing. He says, Ye are they which have continued with me in my temptations. He desired... That company. Okay? Let's look at the next one. Look at Matthew 26, verse 36 and 40. The desire of company. Watch close. He says this. Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto, them, unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. So what did he want them to do? Sit ye here. He wants them to sit there. While I go pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee. So there's three people out of the other ones he told to sit there. And began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Same spot, Garden of Gethsemane. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful. He is letting them in to what they cannot see. My soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death. Then he says, he tells them to do something. Tarry ye here, and watch with me. And he went a little further. So what did he want them to do? He wanted them to watch with him. He wanted them to tarry. He wanted their company. He wanted them to be there. And he wanted them to watch. And he went a little further and fell on his face 
and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he cometh unto his disciples and findeth them asleep. Did they tarry and watch? They didn't. What did he want them to do? He wanted them to tarry, he wanted them to be there, and he wanted them to be alert. He wanted them to pay attention. And saith unto Peter, what, could you not watch with me one hour? You know, I always kind of wondered about that, and I still kind of wonder about that. But he kind of rebukes him, and he says, what, could you not watch with me one hour? What did he want him to do? He wanted him to watch. You know, this, this instance reminds me a little bit of the instance with Job. And Job, his friends show up after they find out how much he has suffered. Okay? They show up. I believe that they were tarrying seven days and they didn't say a word. And everything was fine. What did he, what happened? Job suffered. He was in terrible turmoil, kind of similar to what's going on with Jesus. And his friends show up. They actually keep him company for seven days. This is similar to what Jesus desired. He wanted company. And it actually helped Job until they opened their mouth. And then they were terrible comforters. They were miserable comforters. But sometimes people as human beings, they just want people to be present in their suffering. Go back one slide. He says, my soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. He tells them how he's feeling. And then he tells them, that he wants them to be there, and he wants them to watch. That's what Job did. Job was where he's at, sorrowful, and then his friends came, and they did tarry. But then they became miserable comforters. But as human beings, many times we just want people to be there in our suffering. We may or may not want or desire for them to fix it, because they may not be able to. The disciples surely could not have fixed it. But they could have watched, but they didn't. Now, another one is that Jesus Christ, he was tempted. Jesus Christ was tempted. The Bible says that God cannot be tempted. Okay, but Jesus Christ, he shows up as a man and he's tempted. Look at Hebrews chapter 2, verse 16 to 18. He says, Verily, for verily, he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. He showed up as a man. Seed of Abraham. Abraham was a man. Wherefore, in all things, it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. So in how many things was it very important for him to be made like unto his brethren? All things. He couldn't, he couldn't be a proper sacrifice if he was not like his brethren in all things. For in all, wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. So he was not in the nature of angels when he showed up. He was in the seed of Abraham. He was a man. And it behooved him. He had to be made like unto his brethren in all things. Makes sense so far. That he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, he had to be like human beings in order to be a merciful and faithful high priest in, all, in things pertaining to God. To make reconciliation for the sins of the people. He couldn't reconcile the sins of the people if he wasn't a person. Okay? For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted. So Jesus was tempted. He is able to secure them that are tempted. He can help you in your temptation because he suffered being tempted. So he can secure them that are tempted. If he was made in the nature of angels, he could not secure them that are tempted. Because if he's not a man, he can't help the man in this matter. He suffered being tempted. He knows what it's like to be tempted. Look at Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. He says, Seen then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God. Let us hold fast our profession, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched 
with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Notice what this says. We have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. It may sound a little funny, but Jesus Christ, he knows how you feel. Does it sound a little funny? He knows the feeling of your infirmities. Why? He was a man. And he not only is God, which is all-knowing, he not only has a knowledge, being able to look down, he has a knowledge of actually going through it. He is touched with the feeling of our infirmities. But in all points he was tempted like as we are. Notice what it says. But was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. So in every manner he was tempted like as we are, yet he didn't sin. That's what it says. Okay? So Jesus Christ was tempted. And in that last verse, the Bible said that he suffered being tempted. That means that temptation is suffering. So then, if you're going through temptations, you need to understand and recognize that as suffering. You need to lean on God so that you can overcome that temptation because he is touched with the feeling of our infirmities and he was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin he can help you. There is no temptation that, that has fallen you that it, which is not common to Man, okay, I totally messed that up, but you do know where that thing is. I think it's in First or Second Corinthians. He knows how to help us in our temptation because he was tempted, but he was without sin. He was sinless. Now, Jesus Christ, he died. Jesus Christ died. Look at John chapter 19 and verse 30. He says this, When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, remember what we said? He says, In my thirst... They gave me vinegar to drink. This is when this happened. When Jesus, therefore, he's on the cross, had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head, gave up the ghost. So what did he do? He gave up the ghost. He died. Jesus Christ was not swooned on the cross. Jesus Christ gave up the ghost. He died. His spirit left him. Okay? He died. Look at Acts chapter 2, verse 23 to 24. This is Peter's sermon to the Jews after they crucified him. He says, Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Jesus, Peter, blames the crucifixion on the Jews, saying, Crucify him. We have no king but Caesar. Let his blood be on us. He blames the crucifixion on the Jews. So he says, By wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holding of it. So Jesus Christ died. But did he stay dead? No. It was not possible that he should be holding of it, death. He couldn't have stayed dead. But Jesus Christ, he died. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, and verses 3 and 4. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. Jesus Christ died. It's impossible for God to die. But Jesus Christ, he shows up as a man and he dies, not for his own sin. He dies for our sins. The Bible says he did no sin and in him is no sin. He didn't do anything wrong and the wage of sin is death. He died because God put our sin on him. So he dies for our sins. According to Scripture, that he was buried and that he rose again the third day, according to Scripture. If you put your trust in the transaction that God made for you on your behalf, dying for the sins that you deserve to die for, he was buried, he buried your sin in hell, and he rose again the third day, God will take what you did wrong and he will not impute it to you. Why? 
He imputed it to him because he died for your sins, not his own. And then he'll give you his own righteousness. He'll make it so that you have the righteousness of God. He hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Jesus Christ died for your sins. He made his Jesus Christ was made sin on the cross, and he died for what we did wrong. He was buried and he rose again the third day. That's the gospel of your salvation. If you put your trust in what he did, God will save you in spite of all the dirty, rotten things you've ever done. You'll be right with God. Okay? Now, one thing I want us to think about before we close in review. Let's look, let's look at 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 17. It's not on the board. I'm going to read it. And it's something to think about as far as the fact that Jesus Christ, he died. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 17. 1 17 says this. Now unto the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Jesus Christ is the King of kings, and he is the Lord of lords. First Timothy 1 verse 17 said, Now unto the King, eternal, immortal. Immortal means not able to die. Whenever we go up in the rapture, we are going to be changed in the twinkling of an eye. We are going to go from mortal, that means we are going to die to immortal to where it's impossible for us to die. So when Jesus Christ comes down as a man, he subjects himself to death. It is impossible for God to die. Jesus Christ dies because he enters human flesh. Because God is immortal. But because he came, became a man, he made it so that he could die. Okay? And Jesus Christ, he died for your sins. He was buried and he rose again the third day. Don't pay for your own sins. Make it, put your trust in what Jesus did. And God will make you right with him because of the work that Jesus Christ did. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but by his mercy, he saved us. If you want God's mercy, you need to put your trust in what God did so that you could be made right with him in spite of the bad things that you've done. Now, in review, we're looking at the humanity of Jesus Christ. In review, he wept, he hungered, he thirsted, he slept, he grew weary, he sorrowed, he suffered, he desired company, he was tempted, and he died. Jesus Christ was God manifest in the flesh, but Jesus Christ was a human being too. Man, I sure hope you guys have a good day. Hopefully that was helpful to you. And if you're somebody who writes in your Bible, you got a pretty decent list there. And you can go back there and you can even look at the notes to find out which verses you put next to those things. But anyway, till next time, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Have a good day.